can you just see my screen now? Okay. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Morgan. Um, I, this is my third air quality workshop that I'm presenting at. If you heard me talk in the past, I was presenting as Morgan Mitchell, Mitchell Masters of Science candidate, and now I'm really excited to be continuing the same research with Environment Canada. So today I'll be presenting on ozone pollution transport to Nova Scotia. So just to give you a little introduction on ozone, um, it's a secondary pollutant, so um, produced in the troposphere during photochemical reactions between its two main precursors, which are nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. So nothing emits ozone directly. Um, it's produced when there's these two precursors present. So for these pie charts show the dominant sources of the precursors in Nova Scotia. So for NOx, our biggest source is transportation or mobile sources. And um, that's followed closely by non-industrial sources, which is mostly uh, power generation. And then for VOCs, our biggest source by mass is natural sources. So we actually have biogenic VOCs that are emitted by our forests. But when I looked further into this during my thesis, I actually found that um, in terms of ozone formation potential and reactivity, the natural sources only accounted for about uh, less than 10% of um, ozone formation. So the more important VOCs in terms of ozone are um, those from industrial processes and transportation and paints and solvents, things like that. So, We've done a really good job within our province to decrease these two precursors over time. Um, and that has led our, um, our own ozone production to be reduced as well. And that's important because ozone has a lot of detrimental health impacts. It can oxidize lung tissue, um, plant matter. It can cost farmers a lot in um, yield losses and it can oxidize building materials as well. Um, it's estimated to be responsible for up to 20% of all air pollution related deaths. And um, in 2015 alone, it's estimated that poor air quality, so ozone and particulate matter, cost Nova Scotia about $230 million in healthcare. So it can be quite expensive um, if we don't keep uh, reducing our precursor emissions to reduce ozone. <laughs> Um, in terms of our air quality standards, we have the CAKES, the Canada, Canadian Ambient Air Quality Standards, and those are calculated based on a three-year average of the fourth annual highest eight-hour ozone concentration, and that standard's currently set at 62 parts per billion, um, and that will become increasingly stringent in 2025 at 60 parts per billion. And on the right-hand side here, we have a map of Nova Scotia that shows all of our air quality monitoring stations <laughs> across the province. Um, these stations collect um, observations on a number of different air pollutants, and they are also um, available at different time periods depending on the station. So for example, Halifax and Kedji uh, have really good data sets from 1995 till now, um, and Dayton, um, Kentville and Sable Island are now offline, so they're no longer collecting data for the National Air Pollutant uh, Surveillance. So if we compare, um, well, I guess first I should mention the um, stations are split into air zones. There's four air zones, and that's because um, different air zones require different management strategies. So the central air zone is where um, 50% of Nova Scotia's whole population lives. So we do have a lot of our own pollution there. Whereas the Western air zone is a lot more remote and um, the Aylesford and Kedgy stations actually are, um, are quite remote and don't have any local sources of pollution. So if we're seeing high ozone levels there, that's an indication that we're receiving transport from outside the province. So if we compare the 2018 case to the 2019 case, um, in the four different air zones, we can see that um, two of the four air zones have increasing cakes values, and then the eastern air zone stayed the same, and the western air zone has um, been reduced by one parts per billion, but um, because we're de continuously decreasing our precursor, um, precursor 
emissions, we would expect the cakes to be um, improving a little bit more than what we're seeing currently. So part of this problem is that um, not all of our ozone is our own, a lot of it's transboundary. So it's it's pretty well known that once in a while um, we receive air pollution transported from outside the province. And this is because of the location of Nova Scotia. We are an outflow region. So the prevailing wind pattern um, in the southwest direction brings the pollution up from the northeastern United States. Um, we also get a lot of pollution from the Great Lakes region of Ontario and the Ohio River Valley. So we have several episodic studies suggesting that this transported pollution is significant. So it's happening um, the majority of the time. But up until I did my master's thesis, there was no recent estimates of how much transported pollution was impacting our province's air quality on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I was able to estimate um, using an algorithm that up to 63% of the high ozone events that we see in the city of Halifax are caused by transported pollution. And I did that over 19 years of data. And then to further confound this is that um, we only actually see transboundary pollution at the surface about 30% of the time, 70% uh, of the time it's going overhead. So that's another question is to um, why and when we're seeing that transboundary pollution being advected to the surface. And this is a representative example of a transported ozone pollution event. And this is the type of thing, the type of event I use to create my um, transported pollution algorithm. So on the left hand side, we can see the Nova Scotia air quality map and within the station circles is the daily maximum ozone value in parts per billion and then um, the number beside it is the anomaly change from the monthly mean. So in um, so this was recognized as a high ozone event in Halifax and then I would look at um, all the other stations across Nova Scotia. And if we're seeing very high ozone anomalies in, for example, the Western air zone or other remote or rural regions, that signals to us that this was a transported ozone event because many of these stations do not have the local emissions to produce their own ozone. So um, the Western air stations during this day, June 11th, 2015, showed very high ozone values. And then to double check this, I ran high split back trajectories from Halifax. And that's what you see on the left-hand side there. And um, that's again, showing the source regions that have been talked about for a long time now, which is um, places like New York City, Philadelphia, Boston, and um, the Great Lakes region. So when we started looking into these events on a case-by-case -case basis, this is from July of 2021, um, we used um, model animations and we're able to, again, see our source regions. Um, there's a very large ozone formation area located off Long Island, um, up into Boston, and then Philadelphia as well. We see large amounts of ozone being produced and then transported to Nova Scotia because of the southwesterly prevailing wind direction. And what's also interesting is when it reaches Nova Scotia, we kind of see the polluted air mass um, stretching along the coast. It doesn't go, it doesn't flow directly over the province. It kind of um, flows more easily over the ocean up into the Bay of Fundy. So we thought that Aylesford Mountain, um, the station there might be a better way to look at transported ozone in the province because it doesn't reach Halifax as often as it um, flows near or over top of Aylesford. So I took um, the top ozone days in the last three years of data we have available, which is 2017 to 2019. Um, I looked for days where daily maximum ozone was above 50 parts per billion in the summer months. And there was 25 days that met that criteria. And I ran high split backwards trajectories from Aylesford. And um, the result of that is on the left-hand side where you can see most of the trajectories are again coming up the Northeastern coast of the US um, and into the Ohio River Valley region and the Great Lakes region, which um, are all 
highly polluted source regions for us. And then I, just to compare, I took um, 25 random summer days where daily maximum ozone was background concentrations between 50 to 25 parts per billion. And when I did the back trajectories on this, we see a much more uh, localized flow of the trajectories and a lot are even coming off the ocean there, which is clean air. So um, we can expect on days of high ozone at Aylesford, um, we kind of know where the air is coming from. Um, and we also were able to calculate the average wind speed during these high ozone days. And um, we can see it's about, you can't see here, I saw that it was about three meters per second. So it's a steady um, low flow that carries pollution from these source regions to Nova Scotia. And um, so the next question we had was, okay, we're seeing we see the flow of pollution. We, we know it's going over top of the province. It's hitting some of our stations, but we know only about 30% of the time it's reaching the surface. So why is that happening? What are the mechanisms that are infecting ozone to the surface? So we were able to retrieve vertical ozone concentrations from the model. And um, the best way to look at these plots is to think about yourself, for example, standing in downtown Halifax and looking up into the first kilometer of the atmosphere for 48 hours while the air mass passes overhead. Um, and I say that because I know a lot of people are used to looking at these as um, a function of height over distance. And these are just height over time at one location. So we can see that there are several pulses of ozone during this high um, ozone event. And this is a function of two different things. The first is the time it takes for this polluted air mass to be transported from the source regions to Yarmouth or to Halifax. Um, and that's at three meters per second. So we're able to calculate the time that it takes to get here. And then also, um, once we add on temperature profiles to these plots, we can see that um, when warm air is being infected to the surface, it's of course pulling that pollution with it to the surface. So um, at, for example, July 16th at noon on the Yarmouth plot, we see descending warm air um, at the same time as the highest ozone peak there. And then the temperature profiles are staying pretty steady for the next few hours. And then we see ascending air and a clearing out of that um, highly polluted air mass. And then the same thing happens again just after midnight on July 17th. And for a long time, we've been questioning why we're seeing high ozone values in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning. It's obviously not local production, which um, you need sunlight for. And that's just because of the transport time from, for example, Long Island, New York to Yarmouth or to Halifax. And then again, at the end of these events, um, when we're seeing uh, cleaner air again, uh, we have the air masses, the warm air masses clearing out. And another thing that we could add onto these plots is the um, wind barbs. And really what these just show again is prevailing wind direction. We have southwesterly flow um, carrying those polluted air masses from source regions. And then at the end of events, um, we have a more westerly flow and it's clearing this air out. So um, there's a lot we can do with these plots. I have um, data for all stations in Nova Scotia during high air quality events in the last few years. Um, and the so one problem with the model, though, is that it um, is likely to overestimate the amount of ozone that makes it to the surface. So it was forecasted to be 60 parts per billion during these events, but Halifax only reached 40 parts per billion. Um, we don't have a station in Yarmouth, so we don't know um, what it was actually observed at there, but I'm assuming it was a lot lower as well. And one reason for this is because um, the model does not represent the marine boundary layer very well, so, and that further motivates this work um, so that we can see when the air masses and why the air masses are reaching the surface when they do. So um, all of this is is really good work leading up to the next steps, which is to develop a function so we can describe these mechanisms that are bringing ozone pollution to the surface. Um, we can also use these vertical ozone plots 
for source regions. So I have them for um, Long Island, New York and Boston. And um, hopefully we can visualize pollution export from those stations to Nova Scotia. Um, I would also like to be able to um, maybe develop a mechanism that defines uh, Halifax ozone production events. So I said up to 63% of the time, high ozone in Halifax is from transported pollution. So um, that other 37% of the time, um, we probably, it's probably normal things like inversions and high temperatures, but to really pin those things down um, would be good. And all of this will come together so that we can better predict high ozone events across the province, whether it be local production or transport, and we can improve forecasting of these events to warn vulnerable populations. And yeah, that's um, everything from me. I'd like to thank the YCheck Atmospheric Research Group at SMU. I'm still in touch with them. Um, my colleagues, Alan, Lucy, and the rest of Environment and Climate Change Canada. In my emails here on the slide, um, if anyone has any questions or input, that would be great. You can reach out to me.